years I ran the White Dog Cafe uh, in Philadelphia, I had a sign in my closet that I would see each morning when I got dressed that said, good morning, beautiful business. And it was a, a daily reminder of just how beautiful um, business is when we put our, our care and energy and creativity and love into a product or service that we then offer to our community. Um, so in the morning, it would also be a time when I would think about my own business and how the farmers were picking organic fruits and vegetables to bring into the city that day and of the farm animals out on uh, pasture and in sunshine. I think of my goat herder, Dougie, who said that when she kissed her goat's ears, it made the cheers, cheese better. Uh, and I think that's true. So um, as Samantha th said to me, uh, business is, is about relationships. Uh, money is simply a tool. Uh, business is about relationships uh, with everybody that we buy from, all of our vendors and farmers and so on, uh, with those we work with, uh, with those we sell to. Uh, and it's about our relationship uh, with Earth itself. Uh, and my business uh, was, in fact, the way that I expressed my, my love for life. Uh, and that's what made it a thing of beauty. Um, so I started the White Dog Cafe in 1983 as a coffee shop and grew it into a $5 million business, a full-service restaurant. Uh, and I believe my success came from being a, a rooted in community. Uh, and uh, I, I lived upstairs, the old-fashioned way of doing business, raised my kids um, upstairs above the shop. Um, and I think that had, when you live and work in the same community, uh, there's a short distance between you um, and those um, uh, that are affected by the decisions you make in your business, whether it's your customers, your employees, your, um, your environment, um, and so on. So uh, we're more likely to make decisions uh, from the heart uh, rather than the head. Um, and we also uh, don't have a separation. Sometimes when we have a separation between le uh, work and, and home, that um, we have a separation of our values. Um, and some business schools even say, leave your values at home when you go to work. Um, so it's practice the golden rule uh, when you're at home with your children. Uh, but when you get to work, uh, gold rules. Um, so I'd like to give you a, a couple examples of how, for me, I had a more of a balance of head or heart uh, because of my proximity uh, to those I work with. Uh, here, here's one of our um, dish, uh, dishwashers, Tony. This picture was actually taken in Cuba, where we had an uh, international sister restaurant project. Uh, we took our staff and customers uh, to Cuba to visit the restaurant and learn about how our policies affected Cuba. But anyway, um, uh, one day I, I, I learned about uh, paying a living wage uh, back in the, um, uh, in the 90s, and at first I had a knee-jerk business person's reaction to that. Uh, how could I ever afford to pay my dishwashers a living wage? I mean, forget about that, you know. Um, and then one day I was down in the, in the kitchen, and uh, three different dishwashers happened to look up at me at the same time, and all of a sudden the light bulb went off in my head, and I'm thinking, oh, oh my gosh, uh, of course I want everybody that works at the White Dog full-time to be able to pay their rent and buy their clothes and so on. Of course I want to pay a living wage. What have I been thinking about? Another example is my relationship with nature. I had heard about climate change back in the 90s, um, and I understood it in my head, but I hadn't really been motivated to uh, take action until there was a drought uh, in Pennsylvania, and I was up in the woods that I loved to hike in and saw the effect of the drought on the place that I, that I loved, um, how the, uh, the, the, the creek that had been rushing blue-green water way steep was just dry with to the bone with just dust on the rocks. And as I walked through the, the forest, there was just an eerie silence, only the snapping of the twigs and the leaves that were falling prematurely from the uh, trees. Uh, not even the birds were singing. There was just the feeling of fire. The danger of fire was in the air. And all of a sudden, I just felt, I felt it in my heart. I felt the, the, the stress of the woods um, and, and realized uh, that this is what climate change was about that parts of the world would have uh, droughts and fires and other storms and floods. And of course, now, almost 20 years later, we see that that is, in fact, uh, coming true. So I just went over and, and uh, hugged a big oak tree, became a tree hugger, and promised that I would go back to um, Philadelphia um, and sign up for renewable energy. And the White Dog became the first business in our state of Pennsylvania to buy 100% of our electricity from renewable sources. Um, and, but th this decision wasn't one that I figured out in my head. It was one that I felt in my heart. So uh, unfortunately, one of the mantras in business is grow or die, you know, rather than small is beautiful. Keep growing bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and so of course, the decision makers grow further and further away 
uh, from those that are uh, affected by their decisions. And you know, when I uh, became well-known business owner of a successful restaurant, everybody would say, "Well, how many units do you have?" Well, only one. You know. Um, and at first I thought it was a big sissy because I didn't uh, start a chain of white dog cafes. Uh, but then I realized that um, I didn't want to grow any more than that. I only wanted to have one because I realized that if I had a chain of restaurants, I would lose what was most valuable to me, and that was the relationships I had uh, with everybody in my business. So instead of starting a white dog cafe in someone else's community, I started a black cat in my own community <laughs> next door to the white dog cafe. Um, <laughs> a retail store uh, that specialized in selling locally made uh, and fair trade uh, products. So I began to see that chains were like invasive species. They go into other people's communities, national brands and chain stores and so on, and smother out the indigenous businesses. So that got me thinking, okay, well then how should businesses, business grow? How does nature grow in a healthy way? Well, nature grows deeper in place. Nature grows to become more com complex, not less complex when you do a chain, more complex, uh, more resilient, uh, more diverse, uh, and more adaptive to the needs of that ecosystem, of that community. And that's just how we can grow our businesses and need to grow our businesses. Um, and they don't all have to be mother, uh, uh, mom and pops. Um, here, uh, there's the concept of the mother tree in nature, where uh, some uh, trees grow much, much larger than all the rest. And underground, they have a network where the mother tree nourishes uh, the smaller uh, plants and trees uh, in the forest. And we can also do that as mother businesses. Um, here's a great example, one of my favorites, of Zierman Deli in um, Ann Arbor, Michigan, a very famous deli. They could have easily done a national chain, but instead of doing that, they looked to see what their community needed, and they started a, a fair trade coffee roasting company. They started a creamery to make their own yogurt and ice cream uh, from uh, and cheese from local uh, dairy farms. Um, they, st they started um, a bakery. Uh, they have, I think, like 20 different businesses now, a whole family of businesses, and not only that, but they make employees owners of, um, of, these, of these other businesses. Another example, Devin Walls in Chester, PA, a low-income, uh, almost 100% African-American community near Philadelphia. Uh, for a while, he was working for a company uh, where he and his, his buddies uh, who were very creative. They're artists, entrepreneurs, were hired to go into under-resourced communities in places like Chicago, New York, Baltimore, and do pop-up stores and art exhibits. Um, and then he realized that the reason for this was that these, this company was preparing these neighborhoods for chain stores. So he decided he would go home to Chester and do this work at home. And now he's partnered with a, um, uh, a nonprofit impact investment fund that I'm on the board of um, and has started New Day Chester, where we're buying real estate um, and making them it available for black owned businesses in Chester. And we now have a coffee shop, an art gallery, um, a theater, um, a restaurant, um, and more to come. Uh, because he's growing deeper in place, deeper in place. So we also don't even have to grow materially. We can grow by uh, increasing our knowledge, expanding our consciousness, deepening relationships, developing creativity, building community, and having more fun. Um, and so that's, um, there's some examples of that. Here's uh, Paulette Cole. She owes, owns uh, ABC Carpeting and Home in New York City, a very successful, huge department store. Instead of doing a national chain, uh, she does programming. Uh, here she is with guest uh, Deepak Chopra. Um, and here he uh, is leading uh, her customers in, in meditation so that they're expanding their consciousness, increasing their knowledge. At the White Dog um, in the um, uh, 80s, uh, late 80s when I stopped growing physically, when I had reached that physical size where I was financially sustainable, I stopped growing physically and started growing deeper by having table talks on issues of public concern from foreign policy to um, the, the war on drugs and more recently climate change. We did, uh, here's Patch Adams uh, the, um, talking about the, the importance of humor and healing uh, doing a table talk at the White Dog. Uh, we did storytellings with underrepresented voices. Uh, here are a, 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 a lesbian couple and a gay couple talking about uh, gay marriage uh, back in the 90s when it wasn't so accepted. Um, here's a, a community tours. This is a tour of wall murals. Uh, we also did tours of prisons, um, tours of solar housing, uh, garden tours. Uh, we had community dinners uh, for uh, 20 years. We did a Martin Luther King 
uh, dinner until I sold the restaurant, a Freedom Seder, a Native American Thanksgiving dinner where we gave thanks to Native uh, people for all the foods in our diet that we inherited from them, I invited the Lenape Indians to come to the table with us, uh, who were the first people of our region, and to have a speaker on the issues facing Native Americans uh, today. Uh, and we had a lot of fun. Another way to grow is just having more fun, greater happiness, more love. And so we did these great uh, festivals out in the street where we would have a, uh, this is a Liberty and Justice for All ball on the eve of 4th of July, where we had a dinner for, say, 200 people, farm to table um, food. And then I did a little skit afterwards uh, called Birth of the Nation. First came out a Revolutionary War uh, soldier playing the drum. Then my midwife helped me out. Um, here I come with a beach ball under my stomach, and on, on my back I had a sign that said, George Washington slept here. <laughs> so my uh, midwife helped me into bed, um, and it said, one, two, three, the audience yelled, push, push. And under the uh, uh, bed I pushed out the beach ball, and my uh, midwife delivered my twins. Here comes the first one. Uh, here comes the second one. Uh, the one was called Liberty, and the other Justice, and they hopped on the stage and did a tap dance to Yankee Doodle Dandy. Uh, <laughs> Then we wheeled out the Statue of Liberty and sang, God bless America, <laughs> and while we lit our sparklers. So, um, you know, a lot of times we think that we have to travel to faraway places, Fiji or something, and spend a lot of carbons and a lot of dollars to have a good time. But we can actually have more fun in our own communities, uh, where we can build deeper relationships. Um, and the, jo the joy for me, uh, uh, when I think back, was these parties where I looked around at my employees and uh, my family, my neighbors, my customers, all dancing in the street. Um, and, and that's what we need to, to realize, is that we, we don't need to spend all these carbons. In fact, we should not be flying unnecessarily for recreational purposes, but rather finding ways to have fun at home. So uh, one of the things that the white dog was most known for was buying from local farmers. And um, Mark Dornstrike once told me that good farming was the balance between feminine energies and masculine energies, um, if we, uh, which he related to masculine being efficiency and feminine being nurturing. Um, if we have too much efficiency and not enough nurturing, we might have a well-run farm, but we're not going to have a good product. On the other hand, if we have too much nurturing without enough efficiency, we might have great tomatoes, but we're going to go out of business because we're not using our time in an efficient way. So it's that balance that's important. Uh, and I see that our industrial food system is out of balance. It's totally about masculine energy. Uh, here we have the, you know, the, the battery cages of hens. So the ga name of the game is uh, how little light and air and space can you give that hen? How little food and water so that you can get the cheapest egg possible? No nurturing here, no feminine energy here whatsoever. Um, and at the White Dog, of course, we only use pastured um, uh, poultry and eggs. And the worst thing for me was finding out about the confined farming of, of pigs, how these sensitive, sentient, intelligent beings were kept in these cages where they couldn't even take a step forward or backwards, artificially inseminated, as though they were a piece of a machinery, uh, babies taken away pre prematurely, artificially inseminated again. Um, this just broke my heart when I found out about this, never having a breath of fresh air, uh, never being able to sleep in big pig piles like they like to do. Um, so uh, I just came into the uh, restaurant, and I realized that the pork that I was uh, serving must come from the system, because unless you know otherwise, that's where our pork comes from in the United States, um, and, and more and more in other countries as we spread this madness elsewhere. Um, so I just came into the uh, uh, kitchen. I was kind of in shock, and I said, we have to take pork off the menu. We have to take off the bacon, the pork chops, um, the ham, until we can find a, um, a source of pastured pork, which we did. Um, and here is a, one of the farms that the White Dog buys from, and still continues to buy from, um, out in Lancaster County, where they can sleep in the sun and sleep in pig piles the way they, they like to be. Um, uh, same goes for cows. The plight of the cows also horrendous. Um, and uh, whether it's the dairy cows that are uh, uh, hooked up to milking machines all the time and never go out on pasture, their calves are taken away pre you know, immediately so that w we adults can drink the milk m meant for the baby calves. Um, this is Bill Elkins, who raises black Angus uh, beef, and we started to buy our beef from him, 100% uh, grass-fed. In the beginning, he was finishing on grain, and I said, no, I want 100% grass. At that time, hardly anyone was doing that, uh, but he did it for us. And of course, now, days, grass-fed beef is, is the rage. Um, we had um, um, Buck, uh, his, his name of his farm was Buck Run. We, call, we had Buck Run burgers, and Patty LaBelle, the singer, used to come up in her limousine and and he would run in to get her uh, you know, a grass-fed burger. Um, so 
Here's a Dougie, the one who kissed her goat's ears. Uh, and uh, so I finally got to the point where I looked at my menu and thought, gee, we've done it. Uh, all of our um, poultry and meat and uh, animal products come from small family farms where the animals are respected um, and, and cared for. Um, and this is going to be our market niche. This is our competitive advantage. This is all about us. But then I realized that if I did really care about those pigs, and I cared about the small farmers that were being driven out of business uh, by these industrial farms, if I cared about the environment that was being polluted with 10,000 sows in one barn going into the lagoons that leak into the, uh, the streams and into the air, uh, if I cared about the consumers that were eating this meat that was full of antibiotics and hormones, then rather than keeping my list of suppliers by, at that time, it was maybe 25 farmers, to myself, I would, I would share this information with my competitors. Um, and that was a real turning point for me. I realized that there is no such thing as one sustainable business. We can only be part of a sustainable system, and we have to share uh, in order to do that uh, and be generous. Uh, so I, I started something called F uh, Fair Food and started putting my own profits into the White Dog Cafe Foundation and, and funded uh, the organization whose job it was to go around to my competitors and give them a list of our uh, suppliers. Um, I turned to Glenn Brandle, one of our farmers. This was at the Dance of the Ripe Tomato. This photo was taken. <laughs> uh, but I asked Glenn, he was bringing us in two pigs at that time. And we were, the chef was using all the parts of the pig, which is better for the farmer if you buy the whole thing and not just the bacon, you know. Um, so I said, would you like to expand your business? And he said, yes. And I said, what's holding you back? And he said he needed $30,000 to buy a refrigerated truck so that he could deliver to more uh, restaurants. So I loaned him the $30,000, and he bought the truck. Um, whoops, I went a little too fast there. But anyway, that's the end of that story. <laughs> <laughs> So moving on, um, I got really interested in uh, Central American issues. Um, the mayor earlier was talking about the assassination of Romero and the, and the Jesuit priests. Uh, and this got me really interested in Central America. And I started taking trips down there and started our uh, international sister restaurant where I brought our uh, staff and customers to places to understand what was happening. So I was very intrigued with uh, Chiapas and wondered why the Zapatistas had their uprising on the day that NAFTA went into effect, January of 1994. And I started going down to uh, Chiapas, and I ended up going down there for a 10-year ten, ten period working on economic development projects with them. But I discovered that the Zapatistas, um, uh, and this was a new concept to me, uh, they had their uprising because they wanted to maintain self-reliance. They wanted to be able to bring their corn to their local um, markets um, and not be dragged into the uh, global economy uh, where they uh, would end up um, uh, dependent on international sales. They wanted to teach their children in their own language, with their own culture. Uh, they wanted to uh, not be uh, dragged into the, the Western-style monoculture, uh, but keep their own values. Uh, they wanted to uh, wear the same clothes uh, that they had been wearing for uh, generations um, and not have people uh, forced to work in the maquiladoras uh, to earn a living, um, uh, such as these women are. So I began to see that the plight of the farmers in Chiapas was uh, not dissimilar to the farmers at home. I thought I was going to Chiapas to help them, but they really taught me uh, about the importance of local self-reliance. And I saw their own farmers uh, were being driven out uh, by corporate farms. So I began to imagine um, a, a different kind of world, uh, a global network of sustainable local economies where basic needs are made at home, are food, clothing, shelter, energy um, are made at home. And then we still, tra we still uh, trade globally for what's unique in our own community that we want to share, a special wine, a cheese, a fashion, or whatever, um, but that we um, uh, are able to survive uh, through our regional self-reliance. And that's when I started the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies um, that's based in California. So sort of the basic concept is that um, we have local business ownership, that we support local retailers as well as uh, manufacturers that, and some manufacturing has to have a larger range, of course. I mean, some can manufacture for their region, but some are national uh, um, uh, suppliers, depending on the type of manufacturing it is. But it's so important that we develop uh, local supply chains, uh, farm to table, not only for the fresh food, but to uh, process those foods and to uh, products that we can eat year-round. 
uh, from, um, that begin with our local farmers. Uh, dirt to shirt, here's a picture of my friend uh, Eric Henry down in North Carolina. Uh, he prints t-shirts for his business and he was looking at the t-shirts and realizing that they were coming from China and he said, what's this? North Carolina used to be a cotton, cotton country, uh, but the whole industry had collapsed. So he recreated the supply chain uh, in North Carolina by connecting uh, all the parts of it, the, the, the cotton farmer, the ginner, um, the weaver, the cutter, all the different parts um, of the supply chain and uh, came up with a, a cotton of the Carolina uh, product um, from dirt to shirt. Forest to furniture, how uh, through sustainable forestry um, we can use our, our, our forest to uh, build our homes and our, our furniture. Uh, sun to socket um, and uh, installing solar on our roofs and uh, you know, stations for our electric cars. Botanicals to body to understand how to heal ourselves by using uh, herbal medicines uh, as well as shampoos and face creams and all that kind of stuff. Many, many businesses um, for entrepreneurs to go into that help build uh, a sustainable local economy and not be reliant on, on large uh, corporations, pharmaceutical companies and clothing companies and so on. And I believe that if we have local self-reliance and the basics of food, water, and energy, that this builds the foundation for, for world peace. That so many battles are over water, over land for farming, um, over oil, of course. So uh, we also have to be very, um, uh, very intentional about building uh, inclusive local economies and not replicate the, the, uh, the issues of the past. Uh, and at Bali, um, we have fellows that, are, um, that we uh, support and give leadership training to and help them uh, build local economies in their, uh, in their communities. And, and over half of our fellows are people of color. So there's a real collective joy uh, in working together uh, toward a shared vision for our community, uh, for, for our uh, economy. That this is our uh, sustainable business network in Philadelphia, our local um, network of, of uh, entrepreneurs that uh, practice uh, the triple bottom line of uh, not just profit, but people and planet as well. Um, and right now, the biggest crisis that we face, of course, is climate change. Um, and by creating self-reliant local economies, uh, we're reducing the carbons of long-distance shipping and reducing our dependency on large corporations uh, to bring us our basic needs. Uh, and we're also preparing our communities for what's to come. Because we don't know exactly uh, what it's going to be like with climate change, but it's imperative uh, that we know where our food comes from and our water and our energy and that we build those systems as quickly as we can in our own communities. Um, so we need to turn our full attention uh, to this, uh, to preparing our, our communities uh, for um, the coming uh, changes that climate change is bringing. So basically we need to move in order to do this from me to we, from an individualistic um, America first you know, a kind of um, a mentality to community self-reliance, which really takes uh, sharing and generosity uh, to build sus these sustainable systems, as I found out when I shared with my competitors. Uh, from co uh, competition uh, to cooperation to really working with everyone to build these systems and from hoarding to sharing uh, that I realized that uh, once my basic needs were met, my kids' tuitions were paid, my mortgage was paid, I started giving all my money away uh, for the White Dog Cafe Foundation to, to help our community grow a self-reliant local economy uh, and we need to start doing that and we need to move from fear to love. Uh, we all belong to the vibrant community of life on earth and when we feel that interconnection we can feel the suffering of the pigs uh, we can feel the suffering of the small farmers being driven out of business we can feel the plight of wildlife um, that are uh, becoming extinct we can feel all of those that are suffering from climate change from the wildfires from the floods uh, from the diseases that uh, are inflicting our world and when we lead with love, uh, this is what is most important, that I feel that the transformation of our economy from a, a life-destroying one to a life-supporting economy really comes from awakening our hearts, awakening our hearts um, as entrepreneurs, as investors, as consumers. Uh, and I realized that when I made that decision to share with my competitors, I was, um, I was afraid. I was afraid that my sales would go down 
if I shared with my competitors because they'd all start doing what I was doing. I was afraid that my profits would go down. Uh, and I made the decision, I didn't like figure it out in my head that it was the right thing to do. I did it because I loved the pigs. Uh, it was really my love of animals, of small farms, of community, of nature, uh, that overcame my fear and helped me to make this decision uh, to cooperate and to share. And I feel that, um, that uh, if we are going to succeed, uh, if we are going to succeed at leaving a viable planet uh, for our children and for the children of all species, it's going to be because human beings have evolved uh, to take our rightful place um, in the community of life, in the web of life, no longer as exploiters, but as lovers. Thank you.